So uh, a couple things. One, uh, several of you are looking for note cards. I didn't bring them with me today, but I do have them in my office. I've got an appointment right after this class, but if you follow me back to my office and you want a note card, I'll give it to you real quickly. Otherwise, you'll have to wait till later this afternoon or Monday. Uh, that's number one. Number two, <coughs> uh, review session. <coughs> Excuse me. I have scheduled a review session. It is Sunday at 4 p.m. in ALS 4001. <coughs> I hear groans. Is that bad? Why is that bad? It's what? It's what? Another review during that time. For what class? E-mass transfer. Okay. <laughs> the guys in front are ready to hang the engineers. I think is what I'm hearing here. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, that's the time that I have the room. Um, I will videotape it, so uh, if you have questions, come see me. I'm happy to answer questions. I will be around all day Monday. Uh, and obviously, um, I give you guys my cell phone number, right? Yes. Everybody got that? What's that? OK, I, that's why I give it to you. So, OK. Um, and last, the examination is in here on Tuesday at 9.30. And then it shall all be over. Yes. We should, we should all go out for a happy hour or something. You guys up for that? Yes. All right. I will tell you. Wait, if I buy. Sure. How about a picture for everybody? What's that? You're going to Claude's when this is done? You're going to drink beer at 1030 in the morning? <laughs> Shots. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what I will do. How's this? I will buy the first four pitchers of beer. Uh, not at 10.30 in the morning, though. I'm sorry. I want, to, I want to drink some of this myself. I'll buy the first four pitchers of beer um, at 4 o'clock at Klotz. How's that? All right. There's surprise number one. Okay, I said this is a day of surprises. Surprise number one. Tuesday, Tuesday at four, Claude's beer. Okay? Tuesday at four, yeah. Tuesday at four. Okay? All right. Be there, be square. All right. Now, um, well, there's a lot of energy in here today. Yes, ma'am. Are both sides okay on the note cards? Absolutely. The edge, if you can fit it on the edge, it is okay. You can do nanotech and you can write it and see it on the edge. I'm happy. What they have to be is they have to be handwritten. I will allow no printed note cards. Okay. You have to turn the note card into me. And even if you don't want to use a note card, you have to get one from me. Okay. And that's the same as we, as we did last term. You have to have a note card. Otherwise, you will lose points. And there's reasons I do that. I don't do it to be mean, but there are reasons that for, for which I do that. And that's why I do require you to have that note card, OK? So um, handwritten, nothing taped to it, nothing else other than that. Tamsin? Do they have to have your name on them? They should have your name on them so we can tell that you turned one in. Yes. And you can write that afterwards, the fact. I don't care about that, but yeah. OK, anything else? We've got a lot to do yet today. We're only going to cover the immune system in one day, so, you know, hey. All right. Uh, I think that's everything. So, as always, if you have questions, please let me know. Well, we are ready to talk about the immune system. And the immune system itself is an entire course. Some of you have had things on the immune system somewhat before now. Uh, some of you haven't. So what I want to do is go through and talk about the immune system fairly fast um, to give you some exposure to the sort of molecular basis of the immune system. The immune system is uh, a, a fascinating, absolutely fascinating system. It's a system that is under uh, intense scrutiny because we'd really like to understand how it works. We like to understand um, how uh, diseases like HIV that affect the immune system uh, do what they do. If we understand how they do what they do, we may be able better to treat them. So as we will see, the immune system does, in fact, um, have some cells that are specific to things that HIV uh, likes, and uh, I will tell you more about that.
The immune system has, uh, can be broken up into two big com uh, components, an innate system and an adaptive system. The innate system I won't say much about other than to say that it is, gen it is basically there to recognize general features in invading organisms. That's the, that is the innate system. Okay? It has things called uh, toll-like receptors that recognize specific structures that are common, for example, to bacteria. Okay? So by binding those, they can initiate some of the other immune responses that the, that the body uh, undergoes. And as I said, I'm not really going to say much more about that. The more interesting of the uh, component of the immune system is the other side of it, which is called the adaptive system. And the adaptive system is uh, absolutely fascinating on the surface. The adaptive system uh, is able to make an astonishing number of different antibodies. Okay? So antibodies, of course, are the workhorses of the immune system. The antibodies are essential for recognizing invaders and binding to them. Now, the body can make on the order of 10 to the 8th different antibodies. Okay? 10 to the 8th is 100 million. It can make on the order of 10 to the 12th different structures that it can make that it can bind to antigens. Okay? You can think about those like antibodies if you want to. All right? 10 to the 12th. Now 10 to the 12th is a trillion. Okay? A trillion. You say, okay, well that's an awful lot. But we start thinking, well, hey, the, um, the um, uh, DNA is only 7 billion base pairs. How do we code with 7 billion base pairs for a trillion different structures? Okay? That's almost 1,000 structures for every single nucleotide that's in the DNA. How do we do that? Well, as I've alluded to earlier, one of the ways in which we do that is by switching the way we splice things. Mixing and matching, there's power in numbers. All right? I may have only have 52 cards in my deck of cards but the number of ways I can shuffle that deck okay, is absolutely enormous, far greater than the number of cards I have in the deck. Similarly, by switching and swapping exons, the cell can make an astonishing number of antibodies. Well, let's talk about antibodies. Antibodies have um, a general structure that schematically looks like this. Antibodies, in general, have what look like a Y shape. This is drawn as sort of a flattened out Y. That Y shape has what are called heavy chains, as you see shown in blue, and light chains, which are shown in yellow. The two heavy chains are identical. The two light chains are identical for a given antibody. The antibody's shape is such that the lower portion down here, which has the C beside it, is called the constant region. It doesn't vary much from one antibody to another within a given class of antibodies. And I'll show you that in just a minute as well. So the constant region is pretty constant for antibodies. The other region up here okay, is called the variable region. And that's the ends of the Y up here. We can see that part of the heavy chain and part of the light chain constitute the variable regions. It's the variable region that binds to the antigen. Now, for our purpose, an antigen is a foreign invader. It is a structure that is not native to the person who has this antibody. Our immune system is amazingly set up to recognize what is us and what is not us. And if that system gets screwed up, that is, if we start recognizing things that are us, we develop what are known as autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders, your own immune system is attacking structures in your body. Examples include lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, there's some evidence that multiple sclerosis may have an autoimmune issue associated with it. Okay? So this is happening when the, the, the system is not working properly and it's attacking structures of the owner as foreign. Well, the immune system is very good at that attack process. So you can imagine 
then when you start attacking your own cells, you're going to cause some big problems. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. Okay? We can think of antibodies as coming in five different forms. These are the classes I was referring to earlier. Five classes of antibodies. IgG, which is the most abundant antibody that we find in our, uh, in our bodies, and certainly in our bloodstream. IgA, which is found in secretions, like in your teardrops, in mucus, also in the intestinal system. IgM, and you'll notice that even though these have different shapes, they all have a general Y shape at some portion of them. Okay? IgM is the antibody that first appears in the body when the body recognizes an antigen. IgD is a relatively rare antibody, and its, its function isn't completely understood. It's only present at about 1% of all the antibodies in the body. But it's conserved across many species, so we think it has an important function. We don't fully understand what that function is. Last, IgE is important in protecting against parasites. It recognizes structures and parasites very well. Unfortunately, IgE also is involved in immune response. I, I'm sorry, not immune response, allergic response. It's, of course, it's an immune response, duh. Right. Okay. So allergies, allergic responses, where you can have severe problems arising from, uh, let's say, a bee sting or uh, uh, an asthma uh, attack or something, IgE may be involved uh, in that process. Okay. Now, um, that's not what I wanted. All right. Now, this again shows schematically uh, that structure that I was just showing you before. You can see here, now they've labeled the constant heavies in blue. They've labeled the variable heavies in purple, the variable light in brown. So we can see the variable regions are on the ends of that Y-shaped structure, like I said. This side over here is identical to this side over here. A given immune system cell, by the way, antibodies are made by cells in the immune system called B cells. A given immune system cell makes only one type of antibody, one specific antibody. All right? So one B cell makes one specific antibody. It might make many copies of it on it, but they're all identical on that particular cell. Now what happens during an infection and the immune system gets stimulated is that the uh, body is making all kinds of antibodies. It has millions and millions of possible structures out there. If one of them encounters an antigen, and by the way, the antigen is the foreign invader. If one of them encounters an antigen, the immune, that the immune cell, that B cell, is stimulated to divide and make more antibodies. And since it's already making one specific type of antibodies, one specific type of antibody, it continues to make a lot more copies of that. That's very good because um, when invaders come, they don't just come in ones. Okay? If it's, an, it's, if it's a, a bacterial cell or a virus, there's going to be many, many copies of it. The immune system is then stimulated at that point to make many copies of the thing that's going to help protect the body against this infection. Okay, structure, structure. All right, now, antibodies are incredibly diverse, as I said. And you can get an idea of the diversity looking here at the, uh, a schematic representation of one of the classes of light chains. Okay? Light chain has a constant region, just like a heavy chain has a constant region, and it has a variable region. These colored regions that you see in here are exons. They're exons for specific portions of what become the final antibody. Okay? Here's a portion called v, uh, the V region. There's another region that's variable called the J region. J stands for, for uh, joining. All right? Now, you can imagine, and it's true, that mixing and matching all of these exons 
results in the possible very large number of different antibodies that could be made as a result of the swapping that happens. Notice they're all swapping to one constant region. Okay? So the final antibody that would happen as a result of that switching may look something like this. Here's, uh, and I'll tell you about this in a second, but what, here's the starting material. This is getting closer to the ending material, and finally these are different exons that can be spliced. How do we get from here over to here? What is involved in going from this into this? This is a really interesting and unusual component about antibodies that we don't see in other cells. Okay? Antibodies recombine with each other very readily to excise portions of themselves. Okay? So you can see this guy here has excised this circle that includes J1, J2, J3. Okay, so we pulled out the J1, J2, J3, and we're left with something. We've also pulled out everything from V3 to V40, so that we end up over here with a V1, V2, J4, J5. Now, why do this? Why don't we just splice it, you know, and say pick V1, V2, J4, J5, and make this um, messenger RNA over here? The reason that we don't do this is that this recombination to excise this can make some errors. Errors give even more diversity. Okay? And since diversity is what we want, we want as many possible different structures as we can, this diversity, this, these errors that are built into this process, can actually help to give us more possible antibody structures. Okay? It's a phenomenal process. There are actually three primary things that lead to this diversity that I've talked about. Okay? One is differential splicing. Number two, errors in this recombination process or changes in this recombination process. Three, errors in replication. All three of these can contribute to a very diverse set of what become exons in a final antibody structure. I always like to tell students that one of the things to think about with the immune system is we always like to think and we always tell everybody that, well, okay, you start out as a single fertilized egg. And that single fertilized egg developed, uh, 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 divided trillions of times. Okay? Therefore, all of the cells in your body have the same DNA since they all came from that cell, except the immune system. The immune system has got a lot of rearrangements that are going on okay, that really give rise to new structures that are not found in the other cells of your body. That's, again, partly because we need that diversity for making antibodies. When we look at the heavy chains, oh, here's, here's, the, here's that, that last molecule that got spliced. So here's V1, V2. We make the pre-mRNA. Remember that the pre-mRNA is the precursor of the spliced messenger RNA. Splicing removes the introns, and we're left with something that looks like this guy. And finally, we have a protein that looks like this guy. Okay. In heavy chains, there's even more possible variation. All right? We have three regions called the V, the D, and the J that all are part of the variable region of heavy chains. Swapping, just like we saw before, among the heavy chains can cause a wide variety of things to happen. And you're saying, what are all these guys over here? Well, these are different constant regions for different heavy chains. So there is some variability in heavy chains. And these guys define the class of antibody. So now we can actually see swapping of the variable regions with different classes to make those IgAs or the IgDs or the IgMs. Okay? These are important components, then, of that structure of the final antibody. Now, look at the numbers. 51 possible exons in the variable region, 27 in the D, 6 in the J. And that's if no changes happen with respect to mistakes or errors in, in replication. Okay? So we have some tremendous numbers of possible structures that can be re realized there. Okay, now we're looking at a given B cell 
that has an antibody on it, in this case IgM, and it shows us the structure of this antibody projecting through the membrane and a class of transmembrane proteins called ITAMs. Okay. ITAMs play roles. They're actually targets for phosphorylation, as we shall see, when the IgM binds to a specific antigen. This shows that process happening. Okay? This particular antibody, remember now, I'm at this particular B cell, which has all identical antibodies. Here's one antibody, here's another. These are identical on the same cell. This B cell has bound to an antigen. Now, this shows it as one antigen. It doesn't have to be one antigen. It could be two identical copies of antigen, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So this is a little misleading in the, in this, the, the diagram. All right. This guy is bound to an antigen. The binding of this to an antigen stimulates this tyrosine kinase called LIN to start putting phosphates onto the ITAMs. The phosphorylated tyrosines, in turn, are targets for SH2 domains. You remember those from last term of another protein kinase called SICK, which I guess is appropriate, right? All right. This guy will, in turn, upon binding these, phosphorylate targets okay, that will stimulate a variety of processes happening in the cell, including division. So now this cell is going to be stimulated to divide and do its thing. We'll also see some other things that B cells do in just a minute. <coughs> Okay, questions about that? Okay, quiet group today. Here's that class switching I was talking about uh, before, where we had that constant region, those, very, those different constant regions on the heavy chains. And we see also that in the constant regions, we can have uh, recombination to remove some of those constant regions and make a simpler DNA as a result. Notice that in each case up here we have a DNA molecule. Okay? This was the original genomic, this is the excised piece, this is the resulting DNA. The pre-mRNA will then be copied from this guy. Okay. Now, this figure, I kind of like this figure, this figure shows a cell that has gotten infected with an intracellular pathogen. Okay? An intracellular pathogen. Yes, some, par some uh, parasites will in fact get into a cell and replicate. Okay? A real good example, chlamydia. Chlamydia will do this. Okay? Chlamydia is an intracellular parasite. Well, this cell is in trouble. This cell is in a lot of trouble because this virus is going to take over. And if the immune system doesn't do something to help basically kill this cell, this cell is going to provide a factory for making all kinds more of this invading <coughs> parasite, which is going to go out and infect more cells and cause problems. So the body really wants to be able to tell the immune system when a cell is infected. And remarkably, there's a way it does it. Okay? So this cell is going to communicate to the immune system that, hey, something has gotten inside of me and we've got problems. Okay? How does it do it? Well, this infected cell has structures inside of it that will break down some of the proteins of the invader. That's a very important step in this process. It's going to take a protease and start breaking down pieces of these foreign proteins that are inside of it. These proteases will then, I'm sorry, these, these peptides will then be grabbed and put on the surface of the infected cell. Okay, this is called presentation. It's, th this cell is telling the world, here is the peptide of the thing that invaded me, and it's putting it onto a complex called the MHC complex. 
major histocompatibility complex. In this case, it's called MHC1. We'll see there's also an MHC2. Okay. This MHC1 complex is now a target for another cell of the immune system. Okay. Called a T cell. Okay. So the immune system, the, the adaptive immune system has two types of cells, B cells and T cells. B cells are part of what we call the humoral response. They make the antibodies. Two types of T cells. Killer T cells, that's the first one I'm going to tell you about. And, a, and um, a helper T cells, that's the second one I'll tell you about. Okay. The killer T cells recognize the class one major histocompatibility complex when it has a foreign peptide that it's presenting. Okay. Now this is a little complicated. Notice, first of all, that there are proteins on the surface of this T cell. This, is a, this is, isn't an antibody, but it's, a, it's a, a, a binding structure that you can think of sort of like an antibody that has bound to this presented peptide. The helper T cell is all down here. Uh, all down here okay? The helper T cell, the most important component of it, has this structure here called CD8. CD8 is recognizing that this guy is presenting a peptide that is foreign. The recognition of that by CD8 stimulates phosphorylation of ITAMs again. Okay. And in this case, another um, uh, kinase called SAP70 comes along and it phosphorylates target proteins and results in something really interesting. This causes this killer T cell, and the reason they call it killer T cell is it's going to stimulate the destruction of this infected cell. This killer T cell at that point will secrete um, um, a protein called a perforin, P-E-R-F-O-R-I-N. Perforin sounds like perforate, and what it provides, or what it does, first of all, is it binds to the infected cell and provides entry for a series of enzymes known as granzymes, G-R-A-N-Z-Y-M-E-S. Granzymes go in to the infected cell and basically stimulate the cell to commit suicide. Granzymes are proteases that really start breaking a whole bunch of stuff down. Thus, the killer T cell is able to kill this infected cell. Yes, sir? The granzymes come from the T cell. That's correct. OK. Now, so that's how a killer T cell works. And it works because this infected cell has said, hey, I am infected. All right? There's another MHC class that I want to talk about. And this MHC class, this first MHC class could happen on any cell. Any cell could have an MHC1 that's infected and present that peptide. The second class I want to talk about is MHC2, and we only see it on B cells. MHC2s, okay, as MHC1s, present peptides. Okay? They present peptides, okay? except for they're not presenting, and, and, and so this MHC2 is only found in B cells, they said. Okay? So these are, immune, these are immune system cells that have antibodies. They're presenting a peptide very much like what the infected cell did, but it did not come from an infection. It came from the fact that the antibody on this B cell bound to an antigen. It bound to an antigen. And because it bound to an antigen, it did the same thing. It internalized it, just like we saw in the infected cell. A protease chopped it up into bits. Those bits got put onto MHC2, uh, class 2 proteins and were presented. Now, this MHC2 complex is a target for the other T cells. The other T cells are called helper T cells. Okay? Here's what you saw in the killer T cells. Here's what we see in the helper T cells. This is a B cell that's presenting a peptide saying, hey, this is something I bound to. 
The helper T cell has a protein on it called CD4. You may have heard of CD4 before. This is the protein that HIV uses to get into a cell. CD4 is a target for HIV to get into immune system cells. HIV targets helper T cells as a result of this because of this CD4. Well, CD4 has a natural function. The function is to recognize when this guy is presenting a peptide, just like CD8 was recognizing this over here. Okay. In this case, we stimulate a response very much like what we saw over here. Now, however, this guy is going to stimulate, is going to release factors like cytokines and other things that are going to stimulate the B cell to divide. So the B cell says, hey, I bound something. This guy says, OK, go forth and divide and make a lot of copies of yourself. Pretty cool. Questions about that? You're awfully quiet. Am I going fast? Oh, well, okay. Yes, questions. Macrophages also play play a, a role in this process. I haven't gone into that, but yes, they do. Question. Yes. Yep. No, that's, that's DNA to start with. So those are those those changes happen in DNA. Then that DNA gets transcribed and spliced. The DNA is not splicing. The DNA is recombining. That's the making that circle thing. That's not a splicing process, but the DNA is recombining. So just like we talked about recombination that happens like during cell division, it's a very similar sort of thing that's happening here. OK? Yes, question here. Yeah, so in all these structures, each oval is a subunit that came from one exon. Is that um, I won't say that, no. No, each oval is not one exon. Each oval may have several exons. What, I'm sorry. What's the significance of the, and when you were originally showing the antibodies, they had um, specific like, oval shapes with names. What is that unit? The v, v, v and J, those things you're talking about? OK, so V and J are the, the two variable regions of the um, uh, light chains. And the V, D, and J are the three variable regions of the heavy chains. OK? But if you want to think about it in terms of an oval, each oval uh, on the Y-shaped structure that I talked about, the ovals at the end are the variable. The internal ovals are the constant. OK? Allison? Um, yeah, so Lynn phosphorylates the I-chans yes. when um, it binds to an antigen. Yep. What does SICK do? SICK is a, um, a, a, a tyrosine kinase that binds to those phosphorylated tyrosines and now phosphorylates things internal to the cell. Yes? So it's going to be the B cells that are predominantly responsible for destroying the infection. Is it the B cells that are predominantly going to be responsible for destroying the infection? I would say not necessarily. Killer T cells are playing a real big role in this process. But that's a part, big part of an infection. Sure, absolutely. But then that cell release a bunch more copies. These right. Cells yeah, yeah. OK. A lot of questions. Back here. Why is it that when you say you get a cold, you never actually get rid of it? There are viruses that you're walking around with that basically get away from the immune system, that where they're not really subjected to, target, to, to, to uh, targeting of the immune system. And so you're carrying them around with you. If there are little pockets where they can get away, they do that. Sure, they can reinfect you. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Kevin, can you talk about light chains and heavy chains again? Light chains and heavy chains again? OK. So light chains are simply just smaller versions of heavy chains, if you want to think about it that way. They're two light chains and two heavy chains to a Y-shaped molecule. OK. Uh, and the two light chains are identical in a given one. The two heavy chains are identical in a given one. I'm not sure what you're asking me. Um, I, you're using a term that I'm not familiar Light chains and heavy chains, you know what they are? OK, so light chain is just simply a peptide, polypeptide. So it's a, it's a protein. Heavy chain is just a, a protein. The heavy chain is the part that's the bigger part, the lower part of the Y going up and spreading out like this. 
and the, the light chains are those little things that are attached to it at the very top. Okay? Yes? HIV has a protein that's specific, almost like an antibody structure that recognizes and binds to CD4. Protein protein interactions. And the answer to that is going to be hydrogen bonds. Okay. Yep. Does the B cell actually destroy anything? Does the B cell actually destroy anything? Well, we're getting, if <laughs> we can teach a course in this, the B cell does play a role in stopping and controlling this process. Let's imagine that the B cell has bound to a virus. The B cell, by binding to a specific protein on a virus, prevents that virus from being able to infect a cell. So it's stopping an infection right there before it ever has a chance to get started. So yes, the B, B cell is doing a lot of things to, to prevent infection from, from going on. The B cell may be holding on to a, um, uh, an infected bacterium so that a macrophage can come along and destroy it. Right? So the B cell plays a very, very important role in that process. So it's, it binds to a pathogen inhibiting it from doing more damage. Macrophages play a big role in that in that degradation. Yeah, I haven't talked about those. Yes, sir. Let me answer that one for you after class. How about that? So mem he's asking about memory. Memory is basically a phenomenon where your body remembers something that it's seen. That's why vaccinations work. Okay. The reason memory is actually I'll answer it briefly here. The the reason memory is important. Uh, is because most immune cells are randomly being made and generated, and they have a lifetime of a few weeks, and that's it. If they don't bind something in that few weeks, they're gone. And then a new batch is made. Okay? When an immune system, when an antibody recognizes an antigen and binds to it, it will stimulate not only the, the production of those immune cells, but also a continuing production of those immune cells, and that's the memory function. Memory functions, people argue about how long they work, but it appears they, they may last for as long as 10 years. If you were vaccinated for something longer than 10 years ago, you're probably not protected against it today. That's what we say, like when I was uh, a kid, we all got vaccinated for smallpox. But if I got exposed to smallpox today, I wouldn't have any immunity to it because the memory cells are long since gone for that. Does that help? Okay. I'm running out of time, so it's time for the next surprise. The next surprise is none of what I said today will be on the exam. Yeah, that, that's, that's why I wasn't hesitating to go real fast. <laughs> so, now, I am not going to announce that on the, on the class page, okay? So anybody who wants to know that will have to watch the video, if they weren't in class, and learn. So the class page will say, for all those lovers of knowledge, it'll be there. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to be mean, OK? But it's one of those benefits of coming to class. OK. Well, we have finished the material for the class. I do have a surprise, OK? Um, and the surprise is a little different than the surprise they usually have. Last term you saw me get up here with a bunch of people and we sang songs to you. Today I've invited one person to come sing with me because she can actually sing a tune. It's Linda Benson. Here she is. And, yes, thank, thank you, Linda. In addition, we are going to be singing not just Linda and I and not just you, but we actually have professional recordings of the songs we're going to be singing. Somebody who can actually sing. And so we're, I, I hope you'll join in. This is going to be, take a minute for me to get set up. I hope you'll join in in that process. These are professional musicians who sing these songs. So put away your stuff and relax. And if you want to leave, that's fine too. first one. And the first one is, I can't recall if we've done this in this class. Have we sung his stones? Oh, okay. Then we're all set for this. Let me get the song started and then we'll sing the lyrics. And the song is to the tune of the Flintstones. Everybody ready?
his stones, tiny his stones, wrap up eukaryotic DNA. Using lysine side chains, they arrange a chromatin array. With them, DNAs of seven feet fit inside the nucleus so sweet. When you use the histones, you have to deal with condensation and its ablation inside your chromosomes. All right, one down. Ah, uh, nope, no, please don't encourage me. All right, let's see. Oh, what? Hold on, it's not right. It's wanting to jump ahead on me. Okay, the next one is to the tune probably of a song that none of you will know, so we're going to need the help. It's an old song called Dream a Little Dream of Me. Okay? Anybody know that song? Oh, okay. All right, good. You're going to be able to sing real loud then. Uh, oh. I, all right, okay, I know, where, I, know, I know where it is. Uh, okay, ready, set. <laughs> Slinky. <laughs> Base pairs, they all provide you. <laughs> Stair steps within a helix inside you. <laughs> a pairs with T and G goes with C. Making DNA for me. Helicases go unwinding. Unzippering at rates almost blinding. Polymerases work night and day. Replicating DNA. Sykes QC pack. Choose back from the threes. I can't have a G pair with T, so repair it, please. Tim damages concern too. Cause it can cause mutations inside you When dimers stem from sunlight UV Fix the DNA for me Such pathways of excision Cause cells to have to make a decision should they go straight ahead with repair or take themselves right out of there? Then lastly, there's recombination. Swap strands readily. Crossover homologous regions. complete The DNA is fit for gametes now The three R's for the DNA shine Replicate, repair, recombine Oh yeah! Replicate, repair, recombine <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo. Thank you. Wow. That was a better response than I expected for that one. Okay. I have one more new one, and then we have one old one that we will sing. Well, we haven't sung in this class before, but one more new one. And it's to a tune that somebody told me that somebody in here really liked. So I think this person will know who it is and what it is. Let me get the thing set up here. Okay. Oh no, I miss my class Someone ought to kick my ass Perhaps there is some hope for me Today her make an online movie 
na 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 online movie. Dr. Kevin's always blowing, telling me I should be knowing all that biochemistry. I hope there is an online movie. Na 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 na, online movie. Got sweat on my brow, I'm starting to weep. I fire up my laptop, I'm white as a sheet. As Firefox is downloading, I'm feeling neat. Cause I just found the online movie. Na 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 na, online movie. Okay. All right, is that good? All right. I wasn't looking for applause, I was looking at the person. <laughs> All right. Now, the last one is uh, probably the funnest song I do of all the songs. It's usually real popular. It's to an old John Denver song called Thank God I'm a Country Boy. <laughs> yeah. And for this one, actually, I'm, let's try this one without the singer because with this one, I like some clapping. Okay? So can you guys, we're going to go. No, stop that. We've already been there. Okay. All right. So I, we need some help with this one. So we're going to have some clap. All right, hold on. Keep it going. Keep it going. All right. Slow it down. All right. All right, ready. There's a bundle of things a student ought to know. When Ahern's talk isn't really very slow. Learning ain't easy. The lectures kind of blow. Thank God there's a video. Well, we've gone through the cycles and their enzymes, too. Studying the regulation, everything is new. Got to admit that I haven't got a clue. What am I going to do? Yours. So I got me a note card. Bought me a stryer. Got the enzymes down and the names he requires. Hope I can muster up a little more desire. Thank God there's a video. Just got up to speed about the NAD. Protons moving through complex V. Electrons dance in the cytochrome C. Got to hear the MP3. Fatty acid oxidation makes the acetyl coa inside the inner matrix of the mitochondria. Very complicated, I guess I gotta say. Thank God there's a video. So I got me a note card and bought me a stryer. Got the enzymes down and the names he requires. Hope I can muster up a little more desire. Thank God there's a video. Replication's kind of easy in a simple kind of way. Copy and paste in plasma DNAs. G's go with C's and T's go with A's. Thanks to polymerase. And the DNA's a template for the RNA. He was just unwinding at TA, TA. Termination happens and the enzyme goes away. Don't forget the poly A. So I got me a note card and bought me a stryer. Got the enzymes down, the names he requires. Think I can muster up a little more desire. Thank God there's the video. <laughs> did I skip a verse on that one? Did, did I skip a verse on that no, one? No, oh, I didn't. Okay, I was afraid I did. Okay, thank you all. Thanks you to Linda Benson, and we will see you guys on Tuesday. Yeah, sure, sure. You totally made my day. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought she would enjoy that. That was like the best part of my week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me get the camera put away and we're set.